Dakle, dr. Robin Harris održat će nam svoje izlaganje pod naslovom Stepinac i njegovo vrijeme, što je naslov knjige, njegove najnovije knjige, kardinalu Stepincu. Knjigu možete nabaviti ovdje ispred Vrane u predvorju po jedinstvenoj i možda teško ponovljivoj cijeni s 50% popusta. O tome nešto više na kraju. Evo i nekoliko osnovnih informacija o dr. Harrisu. Britanski je povijesničar, publicist i novinar. Doktorirao je suvremenu povijest na sveučilištu Oxford. Pisao je za novine Daily Telegraph i Prospect, a u konzervativnoj stranci angažiran je od 79. Od 85. postaje bliski suradnik premijerke Thatcher i politički savjetnik sve do kraja njezine vladavine 90. godine. Autor je monografije o Dubrovniku iz 2003. godine, koja je do danas jedna od najboljih knjiga napisanih o tom gradu. U skladu s time, bio je sudionik i dokumentarno igranog serijala Republika o povijesti Dubrovačke republike, koja se ove godine prikazivao na HRT-u. Tijekom 90-ih kritizirao je britansku politiku prema Jugoslaviji, a za vrijeme suđenja generalu Antigotovini progovarao je o političkoj motiviranosti Haškog tribunala braneći legalnost i legitimitet Hrvatskoj za obranu svoje zemlje. Zbog svojeg zalaganja za Hrvatsko vrijeme domovinskog rata dobio je i Hrvatsko državljanstvo. Dobitnik je visokog Hrvatskog odličija Reda Danice Hrvatske s likom Marka Marulića, koje mu je 2009. uručeno u Londonu a za posebni doprinos razvitku kulturnih veza između Velike Britanije i Hrvatske. Kao vjernik katolik utječe se u zagovor kardinalu Stepincu, o kojem je, kao bi sam rekao, i napisao, pa možda jedna od najboljih knjiga. Dr. Robert, please. Strange thing happening. But uh, here was um, 
a small uh, country, uh, sophisticated, uh, Western, uh, trying to protect itself, uh, and uh, that it was subject to uh, not just a, a, a military campaign of aggression, but a campaign of such a ferocious slander that I had never witnessed anything of the like. Um, the word that I could only uh, think was appropriate at the time, and that I have no hesitation in saying uh, it was appropriate, I say now, the proper word for this campaign was diabolic. And I would say that, uh, I, again, I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that the campaign against Stepinas now, which is a prolongation in many respects of the campaign against Croatia and the Catholic Church in the early 1990s, is indeed diabolic still. And the devil has to be defeated. And he always is in the end. But it may take some time to get there. Well, um, this is a, a trad fest, uh, and uh, I am pretty trad myself, <laughs> tend to be otherwise, and um, I'm pretty conservative myself. But it, it's important, we are none of us trying to do this, but it's important not that, that nobody should get the impression that somehow I or any of us is trying to claim the stipulates as a conservative, uh, or indeed as a traditionalist. I'm not sure quite what a conservative or a traditionalist would even be in the society in which he was living. Uh, he was living in a society in which there were enormous uh, uh, external ideological forces, but it was basically a traditional society that he grew grown up in. And in those, I think that the concepts of uh, uh, conservatism really don't make much sense then. Stepinac is part of our tradition a very important part of our tradition as Croats and as Catholics, and he has a role in that. But he was not, um, by nature, I would say, a conservative person. Uh, in fact, he was, by nature, really a very radical individual. If you look at his uh, activity as an archbishop um, before the war, and indeed continuing during the war, he was a very radical force, and indeed a disturbing force, a force that disturbed clearly the wealthy old canons on the capital, uh, and um, uh, which disturbed almost everybody else. It annoyed the communists, but it annoyed, it annoyed people who really wanted to have a quiet life. And there are always people who want to have a quiet life in the Catholic Church, unfortunately. There still are. So, in fact, Stepinac, uh, you know that there were only five, there were only five um, parishes uh, uh, in Zagreb at the turn of the century. Uh, and another two had been added by Archbishop Barr, uh, but that Stepinac, when he became coadjutor and then later after uh, 19, December 1937 as Archbishop, he set up 14 new parishes. That was an extraordinary thing. And now if you go around the Zagreb, uh, outside the centre of Zagreb, you will all, almost all of the parishes that you come to are set up by Stepinac. This required an enormous amount of work. It required raising an enormous amount of money. Uh, in the 1930s, they were poor, simply because of that particularly the early 1930s was a time of economic crisis. And for goodness sake, even in the war, he was founding these parishes. And it, it's quite significant that the, the physical attack on him uh, at Zaprasic was actually when he was there to open a new, a new parish. So he was a very dynamic figure. And as I say, the, 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 there was a lot of criticism. There was criticism from the left, Money. And on the right, they said they were also wasting money because, of course, the Cowans and so on wanted really to have quite a quiet life and didn't really think that all this activity was necessary and perhaps there were better uses for the money. Well, Stepinac had no time for these people. He was an extremely ascetic and rather frightening individual, I think, probably. He uh, was young, dynamic, and really didn't stand any nonsense from anybody who stood in the way of what he thought were the interests of the church. Uh, so, um, he was a man who did not uh, make compromises. And he didn't make compromises either, you see, with politicians. He didn't himself want to be political. He was only interested in politics insofar as he wanted to protect the identity of the Croatian people, and he wanted to protect the Catholic Church. Now that, of course, does require some political engagement when you're dealing with a nasty authoritarian regime under the 
the first Yugoslavia, and two totalitarian regimes under the NAR and the communism. But he was not primarily a political person. He was never prepared to bow to uh, uh, politics uh, or uh, political leaders, but he was prepared to do business with them. He was a patriot who was never a nationalist. He was a virtuous man who was still, unlike some hard, virtuous people, capable of enormous compassion and vigorous and effective compassion, particularly for poor, starving people and refugees. And he was a holy priest, a holy priest who ha had um, uh, no airs and graces at all. It wasn't just that he was a Selyachki, always Selyachki, in the sense that, that he came from that background, and he was quite aware of what his background was. But he was also educated, so he was educated, he'd been ed very well educated at the Germanicum for seven years in Rome. But he was, he was modest, uh, and the only thing that he was not prepared to do was to allow the duties uh, which fell to him as Archbishop of Zagreb ever to be betrayed simply because he was weak. He was never weak. Well, the accusations against him are, as Yuri said, essentially uh, based upon uh, this um, trial, the show trial in 1946. But I suppose there are three of them, really. And one is what one might call collaborationism. The second relates to the Jews, uh, and the third relates to the Serbs. Well, on the question of uh, collaborationism, of course, collaboration, as he said uh, when he was uh, interviewed by the Osna, uh, the first time. He said, what do you mean by collaboration? Uh, uh, how could the Ustasha become the occupiers? Because it was their country. He said, the Germans were occupiers, yes, but clearly dealing with the Ustasha was not a question of collaboration. It might be that you shouldn't uh, collaborate with the Ustasha because they were doing bad things, but clearly it's not a question of collaboration in the sense of collaboration with occupiers. But in any case, he said that uh, one had to decide who was the state at a certain point. Uh, he said, in fact, in his trial, he said, were you the state? You who, who show me? You who were in the forest, were you the state? Was uh, 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 Dražen Mihailovic, was he the state? Uh, or were the Ustasha, were they the state? Well, he said that he said, clearly, he said, after May 1945, you became the state. So his view was what I would say, a completely ordinary view of the action of the people who exerted control with the people who were the state. And you have to do business with the state, but you must not be complicit in the evil things done by those who run the state. Now this is a very important distinction, because we sometimes, I mean, I've heard this phrase used by distinguished people, that uh, the, the description of the MDH as a Zlochinaski regime, the question is, of course, that there were many, many crimes committed by the, under the MDH. But there were many people, of course, working for the Endeha and living under the Endeha and doing their duties, their clerical duties, their, 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 their civil duties and so on, living under the Endeha who were not committing crimes. And who, if they had actually simply gone uh, to, uh, to the Shumi, Ushumi, if they'd gone there, they would have been betraying their families and their duties and not doing what they needed to do. And this, of course, is what uh, uh, Stepinac uh, told uh, uh, Rapportez, uh, who was the uh, Slovene uh, agent of the, um, of the Yugoslav government in exile, when Rapotec uh, came to see him secretly in the capital in 1942. He paid five visits, and it's very interesting that actually somebody could just come to the capital knowing uh, that they were not going to be betrayed by Stepinac, but that they could have full discussions and they'd be protected. Then. And Stepinac said, that, yes, of course, at the end of the war he'd already seen 1942, probably he'd seen this earlier, but certainly by 1942 he knew that uh, the um, Axis powers were going to lose, and he knew therefore that there was going to be some reckoning. Uh, but he said, yes, of course I could have gone, I could have left, I could have been treated as a, as a hero if I'd gone. But if I had gone, I would not have been able to help people. And in fact, he did continue to help people, and indeed he offered relatives extra help for those who had been persecuted by the end of their heart. Well, the relationship with the Endeha, he, of course, condemned uh, the brutalities of the Ustasha. He condemned what he saw as pagan nationalism, 
when he saw that in the Ustasha ideology, and particularly, of course, when he saw it in National Socialism. The Jews. Well, <coughs> it's interesting that uh, at the show trial in 1946, there was hardly any mention of the Jews. Uh, and, um, uh, of course, it doesn't mean that the Jews were not killed. They were killed. Um, the great majority of them were wiped out. Uh, they were wiped out. Some of them killed, of course, in the Senovats and elsewhere. Most of them probably in Auschwitz. But, in any case, uh, nobody suggested or seriously suggested that Stepinac was anti-Semitic or had failed to intervene on behalf of the Jews. Because in Zagreb, and within the Jewish community nationally and internationally, as Yuri pointed out, this was very well known. And I do recommend to you, um, not just my book, which is so cheap, <laughs> must definitely buy it, but I also dare to recommend to you uh, Esther Gitman's book, um, uh, which actually describes the, um, the, the, the saving of the Jews and shows the enormous role that uh, the Stephenas had in this. And Esther, do remember, is herself a Holocaust survivor. She knows when of she, she speaks. So the Jews, well, Stephenas had uh, condemned uh, anti-Semitism, he condemned Nazism well before the war, uh, because he followed then, and he, as in all things, the doctrine which was set out in the Brennan de Zorga and the Vidio Redentoris in 1947. That is to say, in March of that year, Pius XI condemned both National Socialism and uh, Atheistic Bolshevism. And those were the two, those were the two key um, uh, foundations, if you like, on which Stepinac's uh, political vision was based. He was loyal then to the Pope, and he always remained loyal to the Pope. And the Pope also, incidentally, at every stage, remained wholly supportive of Stepinac. Stepinac is dealing with the Jews, with the Endeha, with everybody else. He knew that Stepinac was doing the very best that he could. And as regards the Jews, well, uh, it's a terrible story, uh, because uh, um, Stepinac intervened and intervened and intervened, but of course, in the end, in 1943, when Himmler arrived, even the last Jews were removed except those who were living in mixed marriages with Christians, and those Stepinac managed to save. And it was not in substantial number that he managed to save. And his attitude was fully understood by the chief rabbi of uh, Zagreb, uh, Miroslav Shalom Freiberger. Miroslav uh, Shalom Freiberger worked closely with Stepinac <coughs> during those war years to do what he could, for example, to try to get German children out and to try and get around these terrible uh, the Nuremberg laws, uh, and at the end, when uh, the, the, the last Jews were to be removed, and uh, uh, Stepinac offered uh, Freiburger and his wife uh, how he would have secured this, I do not know, but he offered them his protection in the Archbishop's palace, uh, and I'm sure that he would have stood in the way of people physically if they'd come from the bed. Speculation, but anyway, Freiburger, Freiburger decided after some thought that he had to join his own people, and he was uh, deported and, to and died with his family in Auschwitz. But before he went, he entrusted the uh, library of the uh, uh, Jewish community to Kaptol, to the Catholic Church, to Stepinac, and it was looked after during the war, and it was returned absolutely intact after. Well, as far as the Serbs are concerned, <coughs> here we really do get on to <coughs> a diabolic aspect of this, of this campaign. Um, lies live on. Uh, there's a rather silly little British um, remark about, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. But really, when you're talking about the lie, scale that uh, Yuri has been talking about and that I write about in my first chapter. This is, I mean, these are enormous lies. These are giant lies uh, uh, which themselves are the result of different layers of mendacity. And this degree of mendacity, when it is pumped out by propaganda and the way that the communists did, it, li it lives on. It lives on. And of course, the propaganda, the lies that were generated by the communists have been soaked up and are regurgitated a bit in a rather <coughs> crude manner, a rather crude manner, as Don has been describing the extraordinary remarks of Dacic. A stupid man, but a man no stupider probably than most of the others who were 
uh, really uh, uh, churning out this stuff, who has no knowledge or interest in finding out about the truth. But basically these people are regenerating and churning out lies that were originally devised by the communists. Now why do the communists want to do this? Well, they wanted to because they wanted to destroy the Catholic Church, which of course they saw rightly as the main barrier to their, uh, aid, their ability to get a total control. And remember, that's what communism is about. It's total control, not just of society, but of, of every one of your thoughts, every one of your reactions, of the whole of your personality, to turn you into a different person. That's what communism is about. I don't have any idea that it is about anything else ever has been or ever will be. That is what totalitarianism means. So, of course, that's what the communists wanted to do. But um, when they had they, they, they done all this, uh, partly tactically, I think, they wanted to uh, build up as strong a case as they possibly could against Stepinac, not because he was anything more than a, a, a figurehead, a very robust figurehead in this sense, but against the Catholic Church. And they wanted to exaggerate uh, and indeed uh, fabricate uh, and invent a whole series of slanders against the Catholic Church, both the hierarchy and ordinary priests, suggesting that, that they had been not just complicit in, but actively involved in uh, the brutal, brutal murder, persecution and torture of Serbs. Now some of this propaganda also was added to, with a little sort of, um, I, would also, I would actually say, an almost pornographic, uh, violent, uh, uh, abnormality uh, from the level of the Chetniks. So that, for example, there's a, there's a, a letter, a forged letter from um, a very Yugoslav-oriented crowd who was living in Belgrade. We know it was forged because it was actually in, in, in jail at the time that, that, the, that, that the letter was sent out. So obviously, it was, in fact, we know that it was written by a, a, a Chetnik called Adam Krivicevic, almost certainly. But this letter which I can only say that you might, I think you're all of good age here, but actually I really wouldn't let your children look at it because it is absolutely vile. It is the sort of thing that actually if you read, you really feel that you want to actually to sort of somehow wipe out your mind. And it is all complete and utter fabrication about what priests and nuns and people were meant to have done in the camps. Yes, there were some bad things that were done by some priests, and particularly by this man who was always talking Storovich, this, uh, this um, Franciscan who finished up uh, as a commander in the Asenovats under Lubaric and was then uh, killed, and I can feel no sympathy for him whatsoever, even though it was an unjust trial, but I feel no sympathy for him uh, in 1945. But he was the exception. This was not generally done. I don't know of any other cases of this which occurred, but I, I'm not prepared to exclude that there may not be one or two cases, but that the idea that the Catholic Church with the support of the hierarchy, was actually uh, involved in the, in the physical persecution of, of Serbs as a whole, is just utter nonsense. Uh, of course, it comes down to specifically, specifically, uh, this question of what is wrongly described as Prekrishtavan. Well, it wasn't Prekrishtavan because he didn't have a new baptism. But even then, and it should be Vieski uh, Prelasi, but even Vieski Prelasi, this uh, idea that, uh, you, that Serbs should be, uh, become Catholics uh, so that they would become loyal Croats, this idea was exclusively an Ustasha idea. It was never an idea which was entertained by uh, the Catholic hierarchy. Or, I mean, there, there were, of course, some Ustasha priests, I and mean, they may have entertained that idea. Well, they entertained the idea of Ustasha, they didn't entertain it as priests. And um, the Catholic Church, as Jure Krista himself has written extensively about, the bishops uh, forbade state involvement in this. They made it absolutely clear that uh, uh, there could be no uh, pressured uh, conversions. Uh, they protested against the seizing of Orthodox Church property. Uh, and uh, they were uh, strongly endorsed in everything they did about this by Pius XII. Now this is not a question of speculation, it is all true, all the documents are, are, have been in circulation and Pope Pius XII uh, and his uh, state secretaries uh, uh, support and so on, all of that. All of that has been around since, it, it published since 1981 when the final 
uh, volume of the 12th volume uh, uh, Vatican account of all of this was published. So there is absolutely nothing to be said for the proposition that is still made by the Serbs, by the Serbian government, that Stepinac and the hierarchy wanted to have a forced conversion of the Serbs. Um, the other side of this is that Stepinac repeatedly, repeatedly intervened on behalf of Serbs. Repeatedly intervened. Within weeks of his welcoming the Endeha, which he did, his welcoming the Endeha, within weeks he sent a ferocious letter of protest to Pavlic about the killing of Serbs in Galina. Within weeks. And from then on he continued to do that whenever he knew, whenever he knew that something was happening of that sort. And he, he, he had a continuing involvement there, which comes out in the trial. Yuri mentioned the, uh, the falsification of the account. Well, one of the bits that I find very interesting, that the falsification of the account of the trial, is that um, I should say that uh, the, the defense asked for 37 witnesses to be called. Uh, the uh, prosecution rejected, uh, and it was whittled down to 22. But of those, because of various pressures that were placed, basically intimidation and threats, only eight appeared, and one of those was driven from the court. But even the testimony of those seven who actually gave testimony was sufficiently uh, uh, embarrassed for the prosecution that it could not actually be printed in the official uh, record of the trial. And one of the main things that comes out of that is the degree to which Stepinac had been intervening on behalf of the Serbs and trying to save people not least in Gleena. Uh, the, probably the most striking uh, achievement of Stepinac's um, interventions, and the thing that he was most pleased with, because you can actually see that it had worked, and so often you intervene for people, who knows, what they, who knows where they finish up. Who knows where they finish up. But in this case, he knew that what he had done worked. And this was on behalf of thousands and thousands of Serb children. Now, uh, the main, the single main operation was the saving of 7,000 children uh, who were the, do who were the uh, children of uh, partisans. And most of those were Serbs, not all, most of those were Serbs. Uh, and these were the children uh, who were effectively orphaned, even if their parents were actually not, not killed, they went around to look after them. After the defeat of the partisans um, in Kozala, on the Kosovo mountain range in 1942, catastrophic defeat for the partisans by the Nazis. And these children were initially sent to camps, uh, and um, there was anything that could be done. I mean, after all, there was going to be just left out to starve, they were sent to camps. But Stepinas was determined to get them out of the camps. And he did, he did. And working with um, uh, 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 Diana Budisavljevic, and others, others, she, her husband was an ethnic Serb, uh, Yulia Budisavljevic, friend of Stepinac, who wanted to uh, testify for him, but was threatened and didn't, didn't, didn't arrive at the trial. Uh, through, with, with her and with other ethnic Serbs and others, these 7,000 children got to Zagreb. They were, they were briefly accommodated um, uh, in the uh, church premises. Uh, and uh, uh, in, the, in the Episcopal summer house, and then they were uh, they were forced. They were sent out through various um, uh, through caritas and uh, the holy sisters and religious orders, and then were adopted or looked after either by Catholic families or managed to find they were they managed, in the end some of them the parents came back for them, others were found uh, a way of. Uh, in the end, they got papers to leave and so on. These 7,000 children would have died, it is reasonable to say, would have died without stipulants. That operation, that operation was entirely concealed by the uh, communists after the war. They even seized the card, the card index, which actually showed the names of the children. They came along and raided the, uh, the, 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 the and seized stipulants' copy because the art card index had been kept for safekeeping in the archiepiscopal safe. And so they kept quiet. They kept quiet about, about that. Uh, some, there were attempts also to claim that they, the partisans, have been the only people who ever did declare, help serve children, which is not true. They did very little. They, they, at the end, they did do some. But, but the extraordinary thing to me is, 
Not one word of thanks, not one word of acknowledgement has ever come from the Serbian Orthodox Church for the way that the Catholics of Croatia, not just Stepinac, saved their children. And as far as I'm concerned, if they're not prepared to acknowledge that, one has really some doubts about their good faith. Well, I'm just going to end by saying, on that note, it's a very good thing that uh, Dr. Krishna is on this, uh, on this committee, uh, um, this expert committee looking into um, the role of Stippy Nuts. Um, uh, and it's a very good thing that his colleague, Dr. Mario uh, Yarib, the fine historian, is on it. Serbs haven't got any historians on it, on which I say nothing. But uh, it is um, worth thinking about I, I, what the outcome of that is. I really do not know. Obviously, I can't know. But uh, I am generally in favour of finding out facts, historical facts. But I will tell you this: that to the best of my knowledge, uh, and, and uh, Yes, to my knowledge, and my knowledge on this matter is considerable. On other matters, it may be very limited, but on this matter, it is very considerable, as you'll see from the book. There are, to my mind, no new facts which are going to surface, or could possibly surface, relating to the role of Stepinac personally over these years, which would change one's judgment of him as a man, as a cleric, and as an historical figure. It is simply not possible, because they have been published and explored. There are, however, New facts, uh, concealed facts, facts which I am all in favour of finding out about. And those, these, of course, these facts are more likely to be in Belgrade than they are here, but some of them may well be here. Who knows? There are sufficiently strong uh, communist influences still in Croatia to be protecting all sorts of people, as we all know. After all, there was a certain case recently in Munich which should really, although the Croatian press was generally too frightened. To say, frightened to report it fully and actually the implications of it fully. Uh, we, there are reasons to think, surely, that there, there is probably quite a lot of information about this in Croatia. But the only information that we do not know is who organized the trial, uh, who actually was in charge of all of the decisions relating to Stabinac, carrying them out, who very possibly, I would say, probably tried to poison him. Interesting point. And it beyond that, and this I think here, Stepinac, I said, well, Stepinac was not a traditionalist and so on. But I think that Stepinac himself, although I don't want to put, I can't put words into a, into a saint's mouth, but anyway, I suspect that Stepinac would not be very approving of the, of the great silence which there is still in Croatia. The great silence, which is nothing about, which is not silence about Stepinac, it's about those who persecuted not just Stepinac, but the Catholic Church years and years. Uh, I would like to know, I, it is right that we should know about your settlements. Right that we should know about your settlements. But let's also know about Stara Gradishka, where all these priests were persecuted simply for being loyal Catholics. And Stepinac knew that. That's why he was, he was determined to destroy and discredit uh, these Svechenishka, uh, uh, Stalishka, or Duruzhenya, that you already mentioned. Because he saw that the only way you could be loyal to the people who were suffering for their fidelity, for their fidelity to the faith and to the Pope, was actually by rejecting those who wished to compromise with communism. So yes, there is quite a lot to investigate. Perhaps even new commissions to set up. Um, not necessarily um, uh, joint commissions with the Orthodox, but if they want to get involved, well, nobody can stop it. But anyway, so there is much to learn, but not, I think, much that is going to convince us that Stepinac was anything other than he was, which is a Croatian patriot, a good man, and in my view, a saint.